fundraisers, I'm Don Lego. It's time to buckle up for a new episode of Raise Nation Radio, the one and only podcast made to inspire fundraisers like you to continue making impact in our communities, building better tomorrows, and exchanging ideas. So whether you're a trailblazer or a seasoned pro, you'll pick up the trends that transform your fundraising. And together we'll dive into lively conversations and we'll chat with industry leading fundraisers and thought leaders to explore hot button issues and innovative ideas. So stay with us for the next 30 minutes while we inspire you to embrace the future of fundraising. All right, let's get going. Super excited about my guest um, for this episode of Raise Nation Radio. We're going to talk about a pretty unique topic, maybe a little sensitive, something we don't think about often, but definitely a way to um, think about, uh, ah, how should I say this, maybe increasing the donor life cycle. Um, please welcome to Raise Nation Radio, Tony Martinetti. Um, he is the host of Planned Giving Accelerator. Super interesting uh, topic. I'm excited to dive in. Tony, welcome to Raise Nation. Dawn, thank you very much. It's it's a pleasure to be with you and and the fearless fundraisers and uh, in in Raise Nation. I love that. Oh, you got it perfect. Yes, we have a lot of fearless fundraisers out there, and they're always interested in some new topics. And this is this is a hot one. This is very interesting. When we first met um, a couple of weeks ago, I was very intrigued, and I had to get you on the show. But before we go into planned giving and what that might mean to a nonprofit, I'd love our audience to get to know you better. Um, um, you have a very interesting background. If you could just take us through that and how you landed in where you are today serving the nonprofit universe. I landed doing this planned giving fundraising work. Uh, the, the first most Im- first and most important step really was to hate practicing law. Oh, that no. Was, that was <laughs> Don't a, tell that me was... that. My daughter's going into pursuing law. <laughs> no, I encourage folks. No, not at all. I, I'm glad I went to law school. I encourage folks to go to law school. I'm glad I have a law degree. But the practice of law uh, just didn't, didn't suit me. Did, so, okay. Uh, had, Square peg in a life. round hole. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, so your, your daughter will do well, I'm sure. For me, it just didn't work. And I re-engineered myself as a planned giving fundraiser. Uh, and that was back in uh, 1997 is when well, what I started. What does that mean, a planned giving. giving fundraiser? That means you work with folks who love the organization. Uh, at the time, I was a director of planned giving. I was starting a planned giving program at uh, Iona College in New Rochelle, New York. And I was encouraging folks who love Iona, the alumni, older alumni, to include the organization in their long-term plans. And typically that's a gift in their wills. So it's it's building relationships with long-term committed donors, encouraging them to take the next natural step in their commitment, which is including the organization in their, in their will. Yeah, that's fascinating because I don't know if we necessarily think about that as development directors. We think about, okay, we're catering to this generation while we're nurturing that, you know, the next generation that's coming in. And we think of that cycle, but this is really adding another layer to the cycle. People want to live, leave a legacy and want to be remembered long after they live this physical earth. And if they're aligned with a mission, this only is a, a natural next step. It's it's really nothing to be sensitive about. It's actually a wonderful celebration. Is, is that what we're saying here? You're right. It is, Dawn. It is a, a natural extension of the giving that they've already been doing. And it's about the 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 sustainability of the nonprofit's work that that we know the person loves because they are a committed, loyal donor. So that's what you have in common. You, the fundraiser, with the donor that that admires your work so much that they've been giving, you know, years and years. I mean, I've seen decades worth of giving and sometimes multiple gifts in, in single years, right? Over, over many, many years, decades. Well, these folks love your work. You obviously love your work. This just becomes... Uh, something that flows from the the 
committed giving that they've already been doing. And, and this is ideal for small and mid-sized shops. You know, it's, uh, there's a misconception that this only works for big nonprofits. Like I mentioned a college, that it only works at colleges and hospitals. And that is, we got to debunk that myth, uh, that misconception right out, right out of the gate. This can easily be done by small and mid-sized nonprofits talking to the right donors, you know, at the right time. So, that was my next question. How uh, do you sorry, talk to donors? Question. Yeah. How, I yeah. mean, like I get the colleges and schools, you know, there's that, oh, it's my alma mater, yeah, the alumni, yeah. right? That's, but I, I appreciate you debunking that myth that it's not exclusive to, you know, that population. But how, when, how do you broach this subject? What is the right time? It seems a little sensitive. Any advice there for nonprofits? This is not a conversation about death. That's another insidious myth that we need to debunk. Okay. People think it's a conversation about death. No, no. It's a conversation about life, the life of your nonprofit, the continuation of your work, your mission, your values in your community. However you define community, it might be a local community, might be a county, state, maybe nationwide, international, maybe it's the environment, however you define community, right? What would the community look like without your work 10, 20 years from now? The gift that you're talking to this committed donor about will stave off that ugly future where your work ceases to exist 15, 20, 25, 30 years from now. That's what we're trying to prevent. So the conversation is around how important it is for your community that your work continue. Sustainability, right? Uh, You read people's Twitter feeds and LinkedIn's, so much conversation about sustainability. That's what planned giving creates, sustainability. Helps you grow your your, your endowment or even launch your endowment. If you have zero endowment, you know that savings account for nonprofits? If you have zero endowment, you, you gotta get started somewhere. Planned giving is ideal. And the idea that this is only for big nonprofits and only for wealthy donors, no, no. We need to, we need to, I want to democratize planned giving. It's not only for big nonprofits, it's not only for your wealthy donors. Okay, so what impact, you know, when we first started talking, I was like, okay, well, if you can convert a couple of donors to consider the mission for, you know, their legacy or after they've left this physical world, okay, but we're not, I I, I get the sense that, because you're so passionate here, I get the sense that it's not really converting one or two, that it could have a big impact to a nonprofit. And if they have a strategy and a plan for converting their donors to a planned giving um, project, is that the best way to, so can it have big impact to a nonprofit's sustainability? And I mean, is that what we're talking here? Certainly. Yeah. I okay. worked with I worked with a small nonprofit. Uh, it was a historical society. There was one full-time employee. Okay. Executive director. That was it. All the rest were volunteer. The annual budget was about $250,000 a year. And in our first planned giving uh, mailing that we sent to just 250 folks, uh, they got back six people who said, Either I've already included you in my will or I will include you in my will. So, you know, that's a small shop just doing a mailing to 250 folks. And they got six, six people to say, I'll include you in our will. Or, or, and some of them already had included, but the organization had never asked. Now, Dawn, the average charitable bequest in the US is $35,000. So average, average, the average, that's okay. an average, right? So some are going to be higher, of course, and some are going to be lower. It's an average, but it's not a small chunk of change though. That's a pretty that's good a, number. That's a, that's a major gift in most of the organizations that I know where there are fearless fundraisers. Sure. Wow. I'm hitting your so, raised nation. I love your raised nation uh, radio and I love <laughs> the fearless fundraisers. So I, I want them to know 
planned giving yeah. is well within well within their their scope. Well, we we want to know. We, we definitely want to know. Do, do you have another example of the impact that of an organization that you worked with um, that? I, I believe I read a story somewhere associated with the work that you do that impacted an organization about forty three thousand dollars to the plus. Is that a accurate story? Yeah, that was someone who was in a, a course that I teach. And oh, gosh, it's a course that you teach. All right, we got to get to that. But let's finish this example first. He started talking to someone about a, a, a gift in their will, and they they ended up making that commitment to to do that. But in in addition, this was like a bonus. There was a 43,000, 40 something thousand. You may be, you may have it better than I do. Uh, $43,000 outright gift. She ended up making an outright gift. She wanted to sort of pre-fund what she was going to put the program that she was going to put in her will. So she made an, she made an immediate gift and then she made a commitment for her will as well. And that was not a big organization. That one was uh, that was an arts organization. OK, so I was going to ask, so how does a nonprofit get started? Because it does seem like a delicate, sensitive topic. And, and I'd like to explore that with you if we have a little time, you know, during this episode. But you just mentioned that you, you teach a workshop. Uh, is that true? You actually teach a workshop on how nonprofits can get up and running with their plan giving strategy. Is that what I heard? I do, Don. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't lie to raise Nation Radio. Okay. <laughs> yes, I do have a class. All right. Tell I, us about that. What, what, when is the class available? It, it's called Planned Giving Accelerator. Planned Giving Accelerator. Okay. The next class starts in early March. The members who join me are going to spend an hour a week with me and with their peers. I found in previous classes, lots of peer-to-peer learning, peer-to-peer support. It's much more than I expected. It's Mm -hmm. been chilling, gratifying that folks are helping each other. Uh, But we'll spend an hour a week together for three months. So we'll be done by Memorial Day. Whoa, that's an intensive workshop. Did you say an hour a week? One hour a week. For three months. So it's a a 12-week course? 12 weeks. Yeah. Okay. We'll be done by Memorial Day. And I'll walk you step by step through how to launch planned giving at your small and mid-sized nonprofit. Okay, so how does um, how does one access registration to access the, the- accel- You want to access the accelerator? Yes, it's at plannedgivingaccelerator.com. And for the month of January, there's fifty percent off the, the registration with, fee. The registration. Okay, and great. Yep. Yep. We're ta- we're we're recording this episode in January. So to the audience out there, to all our fearless fundraisers, this is really an interesting conversation and may have a very positive impact to your development. So you might want to jump on that 50% discount, be good stewards of your mission and head on over and um, look at Tony's uh, workshop. But but let's talk about some of the highlights. We don't want you to give away the whole workshop, but this is only, you know, a half hour um, podcast. Can we go over a couple of where to get started? Um, just some highlights. Um just to kind of whet everybody's appetites. I mean, what, what what's step number one? Well, I, I'm a nonprofit. I'm like, okay, I get it. You know, my, my most loyal donors might want to leave something to the mission. I, I need to broach that subject. Where do I get started? First, you identify those top prospects. So those are the folks who are most committed. They've been making the longest uh, they've been giving for the, the longest time. And we don't care. This is an important point, Don. We don't care what the size of those gifts are. Remember, I said we're democratizing planned giving. It's not only for your wealthy donors, not only for your major donors, not only for your board level donors. So I don't care how small those gifts may have been or through the years. If they've been thinking about you at least once a year, and they've been doing that for 10, 15, 20. And I mean, I've seen 30 years of giving, like 50 gifts in 30 years. And if the average gift was $5, I literally mean that. I'm not, uh, I'm not just exaggerating for to, to make a point. If the average gift was $5 a year and they've been giving to you for all those years, they think about you. They make plans for you, right? 
They plan for you year after year. And so they are an ideal prospect for a plan. So we're give. looking for patterns. We're looking for donating patterns, not necessarily a certain dollar amount, or if you have artificial intelligence that tells you that there's socioeconomic you know, or their wealth is categorized at a higher yeah. level. We're really looking at some behaviors. If you have a donor that is given to you on a consistent basis over a period of about 10 years, that's your target in this case. Is that right? Right, right. And the Got beauty it. of that is that you have all that data. It's all in your CRM database. Yeah. You're just, you're just going back and querying people's giving history. And yes, you, you don't need AI, not that AI is, um, I'm a big fan of, you know, sure. AI and fundraising, but in this case, this is a pretty easy report to pull. Yes, that's right. Got it. So those oh. are, you, and, and if, you know, so if you, you asked about like, what's the first step? So you want to identify all these folks. Uh, I would say your top prospects become the people on that list of committed loyal donors over many years who have a, a relationship with someone in the in your organization. Uh, maybe it's the CEO, maybe it's you, chief fundraiser, fearless fundraiser. Um, there's you want to identify the folks that it would be easy to open a conversation with because we're talking to them often, right? So these are your top prospects because it's easier to start the conversation with them. And then all the other folks on that loyal donor uh, list, they become your tier two prospects. And then those folks, rather than face-to-face -face or one-on-one -on -one conversations, you approach those folks either through an email campaign or, or print mail campaign, your tier two. Now, in your workshop, do you explore um, communication strategies? Because it is a little sensitive. It, it, it the wording, you know, it's not what you're saying, but how you're saying it. Do you explore some of those communication strategies and how to broach the topic? Of course. Yeah, you do. We, yeah. We talk about opening the conversation if you're having lunch with the person or, you know, phone call uh, for some folks. Maybe it's a handwritten note. Mm. Right. I, I love, love handwritten, handwritten notes. notes. Yeah. Oh, my God. We said that at the same notes. time. <laughs> OK. Yes. Yeah. They, hardly anyone does them. You can stand out so well and you don't have to feel like you're filling an eight and a half by 11 sheet in word. It's not necessary, you know, to be genuine, heartfelt, sincere. You can do that on a note card. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, we, of course, we talk about that. And, you know, we can talk about it here, Dawn. I mean, I, I'm not holding back on on. Uh, on Raise Nation Radio, I'm not, not going to hold out on you. How do you open the conversation? We've uh, we've started our focus on uh, long term gifts. You know they're important for the 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 work of our uh, for our mission in in the law over the long term, right? And you've been such a loyal, committed donor for so many years. Um, you're the type of person who we are coming to and asking, you know, would you consider a gift? in your long-term plans, like, like a gift in your will. Okay. When you're talking to the right folks and you have the relationship with them, and these are your, that's a, that's a, that's a step. That's how to open the door for your top prospects. Those folks that somebody in the organization has a relationship with, right? There you go. That's we're focusing on it now. Is it something you would consider? Yeah. I think it's getting a little comfortable with a topic that you might find uncomfortable. And I know in any type of prospecting, whether it's for donations or what, whatever it's for, you have to just be comfortable and confident and authentic about it. So, you know, you, I, I like that we're breaking down some myths because if you're doing the asking, you just have to try to get comfortable with it because your discomfort will come across in your communications. And um, I know, you know, that's, for myself, I, I would yeah. like, yeah, I'd like to leave a, you know, a legacy. I'd like to leave my mark. I'd like to know that I've done, done some good, you know, in the world. And if I didn't do it while I was here, you know, so I, I think that it's planting some seeds, some seeds and it's not what you're saying, but it's how you're saying it and approaching it with that confidence and, um, and comfort level because, hey, you might just spark like, oh, yeah, you know what? I want to make sure I'm sustaining this mission because it was important to me while I was here. It's still going to be important 20 years 
from now for my, you know, grandchildren and great grandchildren. So yeah, of course, let's have that conversation. So it's just a matter of how you're approaching it. Um, And, And all of that, absolutely correct. And when you're talking to the right folks, again, we're not acquiring new donors through your planned giving outreach. Yeah. These are loyal, committed donors. And when you're talking to them and the other um, the other little criteria that I would add is, you know, these folks are roughly 55 to 60 and over. That's typically where we start talking to folks about a gift in their will, because that's when folks start thinking about their their will and their long term plans as a method of giving back to the causes that they love that have been important to them. So when you're talking to these folks. It's, uh, it's again, a, a, an extension of what they've already been doing, and they're ready to have the conversation. There's a good chance that other nonprofits have already approached them about the subject, and they may have already included those organizations in their will. So, you know, you should, you should be up there with your competition. Uh, but even if it's the first time, even if you they've never heard it before, you're not going to get a smack in the face. Nobody's going to put you down when you're talking to the right folks and you're doing it sincerely and you're focusing on the sustainability of your work. It's a it's a natural, easy conversation to have. OK, fair enough. So to our audience that's listening right now, they have a lot on their plate. Fundraising, development, not an easy job. You wear a million hats. You mentioned that before you um organize this workshop, the um, Planned Giving Accelerator. You, in a former life, um, held a position as a director of Planned Giving. Well, not every organization out there has the opportunity to have a dedicated resource like that. Um, So what would you recommend to our audience that's listening, a smaller nonprofit, that are wearing those million hats, feel that no. there's just not enough time in the day. They don't have a dedicated resource. How? What's a time commitment? Should they spend how much weekly, monthly, daily on their planned giving strategy? I would say that hour a week. You know, that's why I that's why I structured the accelerator that way. Ah, there you go. Spend an hour a week. Start with identifying your prospects. Then pull out of that list the top prospects, right? Those folks that have the relation have a relationship with someone in the organization, someone who's comfortable talking to them. And then, you know, just take it a step by step, Dawn. Start with three. If you identify three top prospects, can you can you make an outreach call or write a handwritten note to a week, right? That that would if you write if you have a conver- two conversations in a week, you can have your three top prospects um, started in the in the in the conversation in a in a week and a half. I'm giving Just you half take it step by step. Yep. Yeah, I'm giving you half. By an the hour end of the year, you've gotten some work done. Exactly. Take it small steps, and and not only Dawn, you're absolutely right. Not only do folks who are listening, you know, not have a director of planned giving because if they do, they don't need to launch. You know, they're they're beyond where you and I are talking about. Folks may not even have a, de- a devoted uh, development director, somebody devoted to fundraising. I realize that there's shops where it's a CEO and uh, some program people, maybe, and you know, maybe there's a support person, and that's it. So. That's, That's where your workshop really comes in handy. No, that, it, it brings the resource in that might not be there. Yes. Yes. Love and, that. And make make your work around planned giving efficient. And I, I I absolutely I hear you. I agree with you about the the way you know folks in small and mid sized shops are pulled in a hundred different directions. Um, I'm just you know I encourage folks to think about the sustainability of their work mm-hmm. you know, you, while you're thinking short and midterm. I'm, I'm encouraging you to think long term also. Yeah. And, and that's where that's where planned giving comes in. And that's where I want to democratize planned giving. So that small and midsize shops aren't put off by it. Sure. Well, we appreciate that. I mean, this is all new information for me. And, and I run a nonprofit with my daughter. I haven't really thought about planned giving. I mean, we're 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 grassroots mom and pop shop, all volunteer. 
we are that nonprofit wearing, you know, a gazillion hats and fundraising and events and everything else. We don't think about the plan. Shout giving. it out. What, what's the, yeah. now I'm, I'm turning the table now. Shout it out. What, what's the organization? What do you, what's the, what's well, the, most of our audience knows my daughter's been part of the One Cause community for quite a while. She started her nonprofit when she was 14. She's 20, um, pursuing law at Boston College. But the foundation is the Morgan Marie Michael Foundation. We support individuals on the autism spectrum. So. So, um, yeah, I have to immediately hang up with this uh, podcast, get it on the shelf and get it into editing and then go call the team and be like, hey, what are we doing about planned giving? Maybe we'll be in your workshop, Tony, in, in, okay. in March. Uh, let me ask you another question about like advertising. Is this something that goes on websites and in communications like newsletters or in signature lines or on social media? Is it, should it be part of the communication and promotion strategy across the board? Mm, no, you, you want to keep your plan giving program secret. You don't want people to know about it. No. Oh, you're being facetious no, of with me. Of course I, <laughs> yes, no, yes, 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 yes. I think you said okay. four or five different things. Yes, of course. I'm the evangelist for planned giving. Okay. I want planned giving to be exposed to as many people as possible, um, but you can do it simply. Simple sidebar, you know, if you have a newsletter, print or digital, doesn't matter. You don't have to write a 350 word article about wills and, and sustainability of your work. Do it as a sidebar, 25, 30, like 35 words. We're focusing on gifts and wills. It's so easy for you to include us. Here's what you need. Our legal name, our tax ID number, and our address. They take that information to their attorney and they can drop you in their will. They can do it on their own. Of course, you want to have a little info, you know, who, who to contact if they want more information in your organization. But- Keep it simple. Keep the marketing simple. You mentioned signature line and emails. I love to see that. Uh, for folks who still have print business cards, a, a, a print a line there. It's easy to include us in your will. Ask me how. Well, so that applies. Oh, wait a minute. Have you seen the new business card? It's like um, it, it, it. It's like a credit card. Right. It's it's not paper. It's like a credit card. And then there's like a QR code and you can put all information behind it. It's super cool. I forget the name of it. I actually got it for my daughter for Christmas. But that type of, of business card is awesome because then yeah. you could layer in all of the ways of giving. So is that, um, a card that, you, is that a card that you just show to folks and they snap your code? Or you give them the card to keep? No, no, it's just a, it's a, it's like a show and tell. Um, yeah. Okay. It's like a credit card, and you wor you create a profile as part of buying this service. You create a profile, and you can update it anytime. Um, and it's 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 pretty. It's really cool. I got my daughter just got a um, an internship with Mint's law firm. I think that's the way you say it in Boston. So of course I had to get her business cards, and that's <laughs> what I did. But I think it's great for nonprofits, especially to list out all of the ways of giving and make sure to include planned giving in your strategy. Please do. Yeah. Yeah. Do. I, I want to see right, it. So I, I want to see it everywhere. What's the what's the num well, would you say is the number one barrier or obstacle that you've seen when you are working with a nonprofit? And do you in, in addition to your workshop, I've got to ask this question. Do you work with nonprofits one on one on a consultative basis? I do. I have retainer oh. clients. Yeah, sure. I, I'm, I'm a consultant in planned giving uh, uh, on a contract retainer basis, basically a outsourced director of planned giving. Okay, so in the show notes for everybody listening, we'll have Tony's contact information, how to um, access the Planned Giving Accelerator, all that good stuff. So just keep sitting back, listening and enjoying the show, but I'll make sure to get that in, into the show notes. Um, but I want to go back to the question, Tony, what did what do you see as you're working with nonprofits, whether it's one on one or through your workshop? What are the barriers? What what is stopping them from having a planned giving strategy that they need to think about? They think it's too complicated, planned okay. giving is too complex, that they need to have a lawyer on their staff or on their board. I used to be a lawyer and I, I don't practice law any longer, but I'm probably the only one who will tell you, you don't need a lawyer. Okay. Planned giving is simple. What have we been talking about, right? It's simple. You're talking about gifts in people's wills. It's the most popular planned gift for a couple of reasons. Dawn, everybody knows what a will is. Everybody knows they need Fair. a will. 
Everybody knows they need one and everybody knows how wills work. So you don't have to educate yourself. You don't have to educate your staff. You don't have to take time teaching your donors about charitable remainder unit trust with net income makeup provisions. Oh my gosh. What it's, it's, I have. it's frightening. It's not, yes. I and mean, it's totally unnecessary. We're okay. keeping it, we're keeping it simple. So you don't have to have a lot of expertise. You don't have to have expertise. This is what I, you know, this is what I stress when I'm uh, always training folks and, and uh, webinars. And, and I'm, that's why I'm so grateful to be talking to your fearless fundraisers. You don't have to have expertise to be successful and have a very respectable planned giving program. So that's number one, that people think it's too complex. It's too hard for us. I have to, to learn all these things and then teach it to our donors. No, that's not the case. Uh, also, a lot of folks think that it's a death conversation. I think we debunked that myth. Yeah. Right? It's a conversation about life, the life and sustainability of your nonprofit. That's what it's a conversation about. Um what else keeps people away? I'm sorry. You asked for the number one thing that keeps people away. I'm giving you three. I'm, I'm going over. I'll I'm, take three. I don't want to hold back. I don't want to hold back on the fearless fundraisers um, that people think, oh, that we have to offer all these different types of gifts. We have to, we have to talk about uh, on our website, we're talking about life insurance and, and IRAs and gift annuities and remainder trusts and lead trusts and pension plans. And no, no. What have we been talking about? Simple gifts by will. That's where you start your planned giving and you could go beyond those types of gifts, the gifts by will, if you want to in the out years, like three or five years from now, if you want to do that, those gifts are, can all be valuable, but you never have to. That's the beauty, Dawn. You can stick with gifts by will. 20 years from now, your planned giving program is still promoting only gifts by will. And because they're the most popular planned gift, you're not leaving much on the table. Gifts in wills, also called charitable bequests, if you want, but I hate jargon. It's gifts in wills. Don, these represent 75 to 90% of all the planned gifts in any nonprofit. You name the biggest, you name Boston College. I'll go even bigger than that, Harvard University. I'm sorry, I don't mean to dismiss your daughter's legal education. I know BC has an outstanding law school, but I'm going like bigger endowment. All right. Uh, um, Harvard University, you look at their planned giving program, I assure you, at least three quarters, at least three quarters of their planned gifts are the simple gifts by will. Because people know what it is. They know how they work. They know they need one. So, so don't use fancy language. Yeah, Keep no, it no, simple no. for yourself and for your donors, right? I mean, you know, charitable bequests sounds pretty, but, um, you know. It's a gift in your will. That's yeah, all. a gift in That's your will. Um, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward. And what I love about what you bring to the table, Tony, is whether you like practicing law or not, you um, you are or were an attorney. And so you have that legal background, you have the nonprofit background, and you're able to bundle it all together and deliver, you know, really great expertise. Um, and you're telling us, and I heard it, but I'm going to underscore it, that nonprofit organizations do not need an attorney to get their planned giving program up and running. Did you say Thank you. that? Thank you, Don Lego. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, I said it. That's democratizing planned giving, making it uh, easy, accessible, affordable. Absolutely. You underlined it. Let's bold face it. Exclamation mark. Small and midsize shops. Planned giving is well within your scope. You can do it. All right. Absolutely. So what have we learned today? Regardless of the size of your organization, planned giving should be a strategy. It has a big impact. Make it simple, a simple language, simple, you know, gifts and will. That's a great place to start. Great impact sustains, sustains your, your, your mission. Um, don't shy away from the communication because it is a celebration of life. It is a legacy. It is not a conversation about death. And that Tony can, if you're confused and or if you're inspired, either one, Tony can help you because he's got a really great workshop starting in about two months. Do we cover the bases? That's Don Lego, host of Raise Nation Radio. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for learning uh, your exemplary. Yes, I'm a good student. That's that's I'm a good it. student. Are, that's that's the inspiration right there. Absolutely. Wow. Um, 
yes. Uh, yeah, that's 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 all that's all true, Dawn. Can I offer a resource for folks if they want to learn a little bit? Yeah, more? please. We love resources. I'll get Beyond it in the, the show notes giving, too. Beyond the Plan Giving Accelerator, you know, if you just want to read some more, uh, I have a a free how to guide. Unleash the power of planned giving at your nonprofit. And it's very simple to get. It's at tony.ma slash guide, G-U-I-D-E. Okay, I'll put that in the show notes. Tony, what was that again? Tony My memory. M-A. Tony.ma, okay. Slash guide. Slash guide. Oh, that's easy. Well, we'll get that in the notes so that nobody has to take notes right now. You know, Tony, I think we have time for one more question and it's kind of a personal slash professional question. Why do you love what you do and why do you do what you do? I want to see more nonprofits embarking on planned giving. It's, it, it, it's, it's critical for sustainability. I want to see more nonprofits have deep relationships with their long-term committed donors. It's it's all for the good of your cause, whatever, whatever it is that you're doing. And I, I hesitate to enumerate causes because then I always leave out, you know, the, the half a dozen of the, the, the most important ones. So whatever kind of work you're doing, even down to the one person, the, the one person shop with one full-time employee, like I was talking about that, that historical society, you can do planned giving. Uh, you know, this, this is what moves me is to, to see more nonprofits start planned giving, uh, building their endowments and, and to democratize planned giving. Uh, I, it's not only for big nonprofits. It's not only for wealthy donors. It's, it's for you. You can do it. Yeah, well, your passion comes through for sure. And uh, can't wait to get into your workshop and get into the nitty gritty. Um, but Fearless Fundraisers, that's about all we have time for today. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed today's Raise Nation topic and your daily dose of fundraising inspiration. Tune in for a new episode release every Thursday at 12.30 p.m. That's Thursdays, 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And in the meantime, listen to all the episodes on Raise Nation Radio. Follow the channel that you like best so you can get notifications about our new guests fundraisers are doing amazing things to build better tomorrows for our communities stories are inspiring you won't want to miss a single episode i would like to thank our sponsor one cause for making this episode possible one cause is driving the future of fundraising with easy to use software solutions that help nonprofits connect with their donors be sure to check it out at onecause.com visit the resources tab on the home page for a broad catalog of ebooks and podcasts including tony's episode and um, blogs and infographics that you'll find helpful a huge shout out and thanks to my guest Tony Martinetti for sharing a very expert and authentic voice about a unique topic, plant giving. Thank you so much, Tony, for being with us today. I truly enjoyed our conversation. Any last words of inspiration for our audience? For the fearless fundraisers, uh, just that it was a pleasure. Thank you, Dawn. You know, Thank you. Course, uh, yeah, real. And we're going to get to plan genuine, giving. Genuine pleasure. Thank you so much, Dawn. Thank go, you. go fearless fundraisers. <laughs> go out and be great. Well, that is a wrap. Until next time, I'm Don Lego. This is Raise Nation Radio. You stay fearless out there. 